tonight's very unusual for us. It's probably maybe twice a year we do this, which is instead of a prepared uh, reflection slash talk, um, it's the evening's going to be open to any of your questions. And if you didn't come with one, you might start considering right now if there's anything about the meditation practices we do or some of the teachings that are the context for them that you're curious about or confused about or just want to have better understanding of. So what we'll be doing is um, inviting you to come up to the mics. And I really hope those of you that are the types that never talk in large groups and, you know, are very shy, I, I just play your edge because I'd love to feel it, you know, just to invite you to, to, to come up and ask a question. Um, when you come to the mic, try to keep the mic right, in, right by your chin because t- people tend to speak a distance from it and we want you to all be able to hear each other. So that'll be the format for tonight. If it turns out we have time, then I'll be um, closing with a loving-kindness meditation and actually invite any questions or sharing you have about that. But it may be that we have um, a lot of questions, so I wanted to just leave it open-ended to you. So with that, uh, the invitation is for anybody that feels so inclined to begin. Um, just, you can just come right up to the mics. And if somebody else is at one mic and you know you're going to want to ask a question, just start, just come to the other one so we can uh, just kind of move back and forth. So now we're going to go into silence until <laughs> somebody... <laughs> Is it working? It's okay? Yeah, it's working. Okay. (laughs) Hi. My question is, um, you talked a little bit about embodiment a couple weeks ago, and I'm wondering the relative importance or component um, of embodiment versus self-transcendence when it comes to meditation. Uh, so don't don't sit down yet because I I, I, sent, I very often just to get cl- more clarity. So you're wondering about the the relative importance of embodiment, being awake inside our bodies, and self transcendence. And could you just say a little bit more of what you mean by that? So one of the definitions that I've heard of spirituality is self transcendence, or becoming a part of something larger, and that's something that I've experienced in meditation. Um, but there's also like a coming back to the senses. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering sort of like what's, mm-hmm. what's more important. Okay. That, it's, a, it's a really good question. Stay put in case okay. you have a follow-up. Because <laughs> sometimes I'm, I may not kind of get at what you're saying. Um, Self-transcendence, in my understanding, means that we're waking up out of any story or narrative about a limited, separate self. And I found that the most powerful gateway to waking up out of that story is through embodiment and in through waking the senses up. In fact, when we were meditating tonight, and at the moments I'd say, just receive the moment through the senses, This whole world was just vibrating sound and sensations, and there was no solidified notion of a self. So in those moments, that's what I would call self-transcendence. So I don't think of it as relative importance, more as the embodied presence is a gateway to that freedom. Does that make sense? I love that. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a beautiful question. And also one that a lot of people have a misunderstanding of is if we're supposed to be waking up out of our body, like we're supposed to have some transcendental experience that no longer has a sense of the aliveness that's here. And that's, you know, it's, it's, we are made of aliveness and awareness. We're not trying to get away from it. So it's really through this aliveness that we experience wholeness. 
Yeah, so thank you again, and hi. Hi, I'm Ellen, and first I just want to tell you how grateful I am that you provide this opportunity for me, um, and I guess everyone feels the same way. It's just so inspiring and um, helps me grow tremendously. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if you were comfortable um, talking about what helped you to get to be Tara that's sitting right there and that wrote the book and that does that is who you are. What what happened? What about your life or your history or your journey? Um, would you are you comfortable sharing for the rest of the night? That's <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty big and open ended. I will say something that links to the last question is that um, everything has kept coming back to ways of paying attention that have loosened the sense of a Tara self. You know, it's like so that there is a, a sense of belonging to aliveness and to others and earth and so on without so much of a narrative going on. So that is one a beginning way to get at that. But to be much more less much less lofty <laughs> suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, like everybody else. It's uh, um, you know, I've continually encountered all the conditioning to try to control things and grab onto things and not like things and not like the self that seems to not be liking things and all that stuff. And um, somewhere probably in my early 20s, it became really clear that the only way to have more freedom was by just really feeling all that in a very direct way, not using what I call false refuges. And, and I'll just, just to give that name, that word a little more meaning. Um, for me, my false refuges were to try to constantly prove myself in some way. Like it's always going for um, trying to get approval or accomplish something or um, be somebody. And um, also all the addictive stuff, overeating. I mean, all I had a ton of them. And bit by bit, it wasn't like I swore off a false refuge, but more kept on choosing to deepen attention. So I give huge um, bow to a path of practice where there is, whether it's formal, you know, dedicated, I'm going to sit every day for 45 minutes, or the informal mindfulness where we're training our minds to notice what's going on. So that, it was really that. It's just exactly what we're doing together here. The last piece I'll say is what's made probably the biggest difference over time for me is I have gotten much kinder to myself. Mm. That the reason I wrote Radical Acceptance is because I suffered from, you know, this chronic sense of not enough. Like if I did a hand raise, I'm sure I wouldn't be in, I'd be in good company. We, we have that. And... Um, I committed uh, myself, and this again was in my 20s, to softening to myself. Mm -hmm. And that's made a big difference. So th thank you for your questions. I, like, you. I, I feel when you invite me in, I guess I, I get to feel more a part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm uh, puzzled or bothered by a contradiction between radical acceptance, which I find very calming. And on the other hand, uh, the desire to change some things, which it seems to me uh, remains appropriate. A and I don't want to give up entirely. So you're juxtaposing radical acceptance, acceptance. with that there's still a desire to change things and you don't want to give that up. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, me too. I mean, I, I have a desire to change things too. And radical acceptance means accepting that desire to change things. And the desire to, ch you know, I'm not trying to be clever, really. The desire to change things itself is not um, necessarily an obstacle or ignorant. It can come out of um, a very sincere place in us 
that recognizes what's causing suffering. You know, where we see what the kind of devastation that, um, that industries are doing to this earth and that we're doing with our habit patterns to this earth. Well, I would suspect there's a lot of us here that have a passionate mm -hmm. desire to see um, through, you know, legislation and through a behavior of, of industries and individuals that we take care of our earth. So that's passionate and deep. And radical acceptance does not mean that we don't have that. What radical acceptance means, and this is, um, to me, really powerful and central, is that we can unconditionally accept the experience that's going on in this moment. That if I am paying attention right now to... Um, the debates, and I'm feeling a, a sinking sense of, wow, there's not really a commitment to our Earth, or there's not really the kind of commitment to peace that's really going to make a difference. You know, if I feel that, then it's opening to that sense of discouragement or despair or sadness in, in my heart, in this moment that's radical acceptance. And if I open to it, then the urge to act and change is coming from a much more intelligent and awake place. So the idea is accept the experience of the moment and then have your life lived out of that acceptance, including our efforts to transform uh, the world around us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Tara. Um, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions and, yeah. and uh, I'm getting a sense of how difficult it must be to sit up there uh, week after week and talk to people because I feel very self-conscious just uh, coming up to ask a question. But I um, wanted to ask, you know, I have a, a metta practice or sometimes I practice metta. And I find that the most difficult thing sometimes is to feel metta towards myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, extend to, to myself the kind of loving kindness mm -hmm. that, you know, is sometimes easier to extend towards other people. And there's always the sense of self-criticism and th that I, I, you know, I come to think is the largest impediment sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, I don't know, living a less separate, you know, a more fuller existence in some way. Mm -hmm. And I, I know a lot of what we talk about is, is that kind of thing, but I was wondering if, if you might be able to talk a little bit about, you know, more specifically about how to overcome that mm -hmm. difficulty in extending to yourself the loving kindness that we also try to extend to others. So, uh, and please stay for, uh, stay by the mic so I, if I can ask you um, back, because I think it's a wonderful question. It's one of the most important, is how do we really, if we're saying, you know, that we're trying to cultivate these two wings of, of presence, and one wing is to see what's true, and the other is to hold it with love, we have to be able to do that with this, this body-mind being we call self. And so and what you're saying is when you try to do that, when you try to offer a caring presence to yourself, that's the hardest place, yeah. Let me ask you a question, which is, has there been anything or any times that you find that something has helped you in regarding yourself with, uh, with more care? Are there any circumstances that do help? Yeah, yeah, you know, unfortunately like, unfortunately, like you were saying, it's, you know, frequently external. You know, it's sure. somebody gives you approval or you mm -hmm. win something or, you know, you get a pat on the back. But, uh, you know, and, and that kind of thing is frequently where the, you know, impetus for that mm -hmm. comes from. But mm -hmm. it's so much more difficult, you know, without that kind of external thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're um, accurately noting that usually the surge is somewhat more like of an ego inflation, where we temporarily feel relieved that we're not bad, <laughs> or we feel, you know, all right, I'm okay for now. But the way that that comes to you actually is important, because there is a power in doing... Uh, the metta me is another a description of the loving-kindness practice. And one of the words for metta is friendliness. 
So it has both friendliness and loving kindness. And the way that metta, or loving kindness, is aroused is by seeing goodness. So the reflection really is, can you begin to look at your own being and see your own goodness? And and that, for many of us, is hard. So there are skillful means, which means pathways to that, that are less direct. And one of them is often by looking through the eyes of somebody else that you trust and care about at yourself, as if you're that person, and I've asked that person the question, well, what are you, looking through your eyes, what do you see, you know? So that, that's one way, is to let somebody else's um, appreciation of you inform you, and to actually, um, and you, just for a moment, you all might just um, close your eyes and check this out. Just try it out, see what happens. <laughs> And if you'd be more comfortable sitting, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, because it's so important, we'll just do a brief exercise. So feel that right now your intention is to offer your own being loving kindness. And we're going to explore some of the pathways on how that's possible. And so, as I mentioned, one is to just begin to reflect on the qualities about yourself that you appreciate. So begin by trying that out. Just sense, well, um, I have an appreciation of beauty, our nature. I'm just going to name a few that come to mind that some of us can say, well, yeah, that's true. And I have a sense of humor. And I do care about people. There's a sense of aliveness, of enjoying feeling alive. And I can be generous. So you, you kind of move like that. You just start noticing, okay, there's, here are the, some qualities of goodness. I want to know truth. Truth matters. I'm honest. I try to be helpful to people. So you just keep going like that. And let's say there's a part of you that's going, yeah, but there's always something that comes my way for it. There's always a selfish motive, because we, we often undermine our, ourselves that way. Then explore bringing to mind someone that you really do trust, sees you, and cares about you. In other words, they get you, and they care about you. And it might be somebody that you know very well, or it might be somebody that you don't know so well, but you think there's a lot of wisdom in that person, and kindness, and and you kind of trust that they can see behind the mask and see the goodness. An experiment looking through that person's eyes. This takes a little bit of mental agility, but it's doable if you practice some. What does that person see? Does that person see your sincerity and that you care about waking up and growing? Your good heart? It can help to imagine that person looking at you with appreciation and care. Just imagine those eyes are looking at you and valuing you, caring about you. And you might, if you'd like to experiment, put your hand on your own heart and sense their energy, their care, their appreciation, just as an energetic, very real energetic kind of force that just kind of enters through your hand into your heart. So you start being bathed by that sense of another person's appreciation of you. And see if you can agree to let it in a little. And then just to try to sense, well, what is the wish you'd like to offer to yourself? Maybe the wish you'd like to offer yourself is 
may I trust myself more. May I be kinder to myself. May I hold this life with compassion. May I be forgiven. So sense what you'd like to wish for yourself. And just let the touch, you might even feel the touch is very tender, that 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 wish is coming through your hand into your heart. May I move through life with the intention to be kind to myself and others. This is the heart of the loving-kindness practice, that we begin to find a way to offer care to the life that's right here. And the way the door opens as a way to close this exercise is simply with your intention. If even in this little exercise you feel your intention to be kinder, that cracks the door open in a profound way. So I thank you for your question. It gave us a, uh, an excuse to have a little bit of that flavor of loving-kindness in the room. So that was fun. Yeah. So anyone else right now for questions? Yeah. Hi. As, as somebody relatively new to meditation, this is a very basic technical question, sure. but I'm wondering if you could comment on different techniques for staying awake during the guided meditation. <laughs> Are you falling asleep during my meditation? I, I, I did. <laughs> that hypnotic kind of... <laughs> it's actually... Um, it's basic and really an important question. I, you know, in, in Buddhist uh, meditation teachings, there are five energies that are considered to be universal and that we all encounter at different times, you know, all of us. And one of them is that when we're sitting, there's something in us that is wanting something different, or I want food, or I want to leave, or, you know, I want to, you know, go fantasize. So there's that kind of grasping mind. And then there's a part of us, the aversive mind, that's saying, I don't like this my body's uncomfortable, when is this going to end, you know, that kind of thing. That's the aversive, the aversive mind. Then there's the part of us, and um, this is coming to your question, that that's, has to do with sleepiness, kind of a, a heaviness. It's called sloth and torpor, <laughs> you know, like a sloth. And um, it's, a, it's a heavy energy, because here you have your meditation coach up front saying, experience the wakefulness of your, you know, and, and you're sitting there, you know. <laughs> So that's, that's the third. And then the other two are restlessness. I'm sure some of you know what it's like just to feel like you're going to explode. You just need to move to do something. And then the fifth is doubt, which is considered the most paralyzing. Because if you have doubt, which is like, I'm not really cut out for this, or this isn't cut out for me, or whatever it is, it, it stops you from making the effort how to work with these things. And there's always two levels of how you work with any of these challenges. And one of the levels is that there are kind of skillful ways you can, um, kind of antidotes. So with sleepiness, you sit up a little taller, open your eyes, there's no law that says you have to meditate with your eyes closed, okay? Really, I mean, think of it. M- most of our day, our eyes are open. If we only had a training to be meditative with our eyes closed, that would be a real shame. We'd miss out on huge swaths of moments, right? So, so open your eyes, sit up taller. You can stand up. If you come to any of our retreats, you'll notice that at any given sitting, pe- some people are standing because you can get more energy that way. Okay? Take a few full breaths. Sometimes listening to sound alerts and refreshes the mind more than the breath, which can be much more tranquilizing. So those are examples of tricks that are skillful. 
more important is not to make it wrong. If you are finding yourself lulled and kind of soporific during a guided meditation, radical acceptance, just, oh, it's like this right now. It's just another weather system. Right now it's kind of balmy and sleepy. Another time it's kind of windy and agitated. Another time it's whatever. So let it be a weather system. You know, kind of just name it. Okay, sleepy and bow to it. Okay, this is how it is. And get curious. If you're curious about it, like what is sleepiness like? And even though the mind's not that alert to investigate with precision, you might sense, okay, kind of fuzzy and heavy here. For me, there's kind of a pressure or a weight on my chest usually when I'm sleepy. Um, Just start noticing that. If you really pay attention, you might notice that you've added something to sleepiness, which is, I shouldn't be sleepy. Be mindful of that. Because the only suffering that comes in meditation is when we say it shouldn't be like this. So I'm looking at you, but I'm really speaking to all of us, that um, it's just one of the universal energies, not to make it wrong. Mindfulness, non-judgment, a few little skillful means to do what you can and let it go. Yeah, thank you. It was a good question. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Hey. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, dealing with small children with the Four Noble Truths and like when you, you have a child that you know could benefit from a little bit of detachment and what kind of uh, vocabulary you would use and, and things like that, just a little bit of help. Yeah, so this question about um, how to bring some of the basic principles to our children is probably too big for me to even do justice with a few words. But what uh, more I can point to some resources. Uh, what age are we talking? Uh, kindergarten, first grade. Yeah. Um, check, our, check the IMCW website for the family programs and for there's there's a few different ones one in Arlington one here in Bethesda and the teachers that are working with the children are wonderful at giving metaphors and stories that actually convey just what you're talking about the uh, that there's so much more happiness when we're not you know lost in our weather system and you know that kind of thing so check that out Thich Nhat Hanh has a beautiful book on meditating with children and I'm free, I think it has the word seeds in it if anybody here knows it uh, do you know it? Yeah. You have it. I have it too, and I can't remember the name. But if you look, it just came out recently. It's really lovely. And um, more what I would say is it's how we are. That it's way more important that um, we are um, able to find a place of not being overly reactive, of having some space, of some perspective, than whatever we convey to them, because that's that's what we're really conveying as our own energy. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. <laughs>